Ahoy there, and welcome to the She Sails Solo podcast. My name is Reagan, and I'll be your host and captain for this journey. Here, I'll skipper you through tales of my adventures as I navigate life as a female sailor, as well as share stories and advice from other women on the water. So, let's cast off the lines and set sail as we voyage towards a better sea for every she. Hello, and welcome to the first interview of the She Sails Solo podcast. Today, we're going to be hearing from my personal friend and fellow Warham Wild woman, Kiana from Where's Kiana? Kiana has lived aboard her old Warham catamaran, Mara Noka, since 2018. With her boat, she has undergone a complete refit, as well as multiple Atlantic crossings, both alone, as well as with crew recently, to film a documentary project with her nonprofit, Women and the Wind. In today's episode, we discuss that project, as well as what it's like living differently on a simple wooden catamaran. I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned. Thank you for coming on. I'm so excited to have you in chat. I'm so stoked. (laughs) I'm really excited about the whole project. And I think it's such a great thing to bring a voice to all us female sailors. It's really awesome what you're doing. I definitely think it'll be good to have like a general hub of need inspiration for people who look and are similar to me makes it a lot easier, especially when you're first entering a new space to be like, oh, there are other people like me doing right, it. Right, there's a, a reference. Us, but it's it's kind of hard to to find us. So if I can make true. it easier to like, here's a lot of people, here's an introduction in their story, and then whoever you click with, go from there. Yeah. I think that, I love that'll it. be really helpful. So talking about our stories, do you want to share a little bit about who you are and how you got into this whole world of sailing and living on boats and doing crazy passages? That's a long one. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I used to have a professional job and I used to dress up real nice and have a nice car and have a nice apartment and I lived in Miami and I just had this feeling that if I didn't take a break and get out I wouldn't be able to do that until I reached retirement uh so I decided to like take a year off and go travel. My plan was to backpack through Central and South America and then go back, go back to Miami. Uh, But right away I found out that I really enjoyed my home a lot and I love having a home and my own space and like my own bed. And I don't know, I I found out very quickly that I wasn't going to like sleeping in hostels every night and... Uh, then I found a volunteer job on a on a catamaran on a Fontaine Peugeot as an English teacher, and I did that for a couple months. And that was like a slight, in- like that was the first time I realized that people sailed around with their families or like did any sailing that was more than like you know a few hours on a Sunday, yeah. <laughs> which I didn't know. But it still seemed very inaccessible to me. It was a Fontaine Peugeot, like 40-something feet, and obviously very expensive, lots of equipment, lots of everything that I would definitely need to go back to work to be able to uh, achieve. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) I wasn't ready to do that yet. But luckily, then I met a pirate. And I've always wanted to be a pirate. So to meet like a crazy man that he lives on a 75-foot Polynesian voyaging canoe. Uh, Used to live on a warham for 16 years. He lived on a warham. And uh, so I learned about warhams and simple sailing and catamarans and wooden boats and lashing as structure all from him I just always knew that like ever since I started living on boats I knew that I wanted my own boat and I wanted to recreate that home that I used to have in my my own space and oh it's just so good (laughs) for anyone um 
that's listening doesn't know, Kiana and I are on basic pretty much very, very, very similar boats. They're both Narai, yeah. uh, Warham Narai catamarans, but um, very different, very different souls on both of our boats. So Totally. Yours yeah. is way more spacious. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like inside it is, but your I mean nothing compares your deck your deck is just flat like flat huge insane <laughs> thanks or do you like cartwheels across it big deck energy yeah you know. <laughs> we met when you were in the a boatyard in St. Augustine and you were doing a complete refit of your boat yeah and like you were just saying, when you first got into it, you weren't very familiar with it. It was just something that you're interested in and drawn to. So obviously sailing, learning how to sail is one aspect of this whole lifestyle. But learning how to actually like care for and repair a boat is another. What would you say some of your biggest challenges as well as like advice would be when it comes to learning all of these skill sets that are really important, especially when handling a boat by yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, hard. It's, uh, I feel very uncomfortable giving advice just because I don't know. I don't know. Maybe what I'm doing with my, my life is not that smart and other people should. <laughs> <laughs> I get comments all the time on my videos on my refit and they're like, you should show more of the process of what you're doing. So other people, I'm like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, yeah, lots of trial and error. And I was really lucky like, like when I started and I was learning how to sail on the boat on Maranoka. I, I was very naive. I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about stru- boat structure. I didn't know that boats weren't supposed to like leak as much as mine was. <laughs> and I just thought it was normal. I don't know. But what really helped me when it came to then the renovation was that I had already sailed the boat some. Most people would have not sailed the boat in the condition that it was in. It was quite uh, unsafe, very, very wet, uh, but I did. And, and so when I did take it out of the water, I knew the potential of the boat. I knew that whatever I did to it would only make it better because it was sailing and it, and it likes sailing. Um, and I also then had a, a bigger awareness of what was most important to get done because they were what was affecting the sailing the most. And then the other things I would find along the way uh, during a refit, which you know is it's like you open cans of worms anytime you poke anything. Um, I was able to like judge more or less the importance of the job based on how it was performing before you know and that helps a lot otherwise I would have been in the yard forever and most likely like with the state that Maranaka was in if I really had no clue at all like and, and also no reference I had no reference at the time you know there were there was no other women on warrams there were no other warrams around and if there were they were all old men that have been sitting in some place forever because I don't sail anymore. <laughs> so I probably would have given up just because it would have been super, super overwhelming. So, I mean, it's just taking it one day at a time and really like following your gut instinct. For me, I was very lucky that th- through learning how to sail and, and also the refit of the boat, there were many hardships, but the, every moment I knew that I was in the right place. Like this feels good. This feels right. No matter how hard it is, no matter how much it sucks sometimes, or it's lonely or uh, all the emotions, I had an inclination that I was on the right path. And so I trusted that. And I think that's probably the most important thing is, is that because I mean, even if you're doing something that, Maybe you thought was the right path and something just doesn't feel right. There might be something better out there, you know? Really feeling that strong connection to your boat. I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, 
you hear it all the time when people are talking about buying a new home when they like walk in and they're like oh like this just feels like the right place for Mm -hmm. us and with a boat it's very similar and I would almost venture to even more so because you're actively like working with the boat to do the boat's intended purpose as well as your own so it re- there really has to be that harmony between you and your vessel it's like a living absolutely yeah for sure uh, definitely and and that's the thing yeah the boat talks to you and, and there's something about our boats uh, or or old boats in general boats that have already lived lives before us you know there's something about that that's just really really magical and really powerful and the way that the boats talk to you and uh I don't know I love it (laughs) from the yard you left and you started your women in the wind documentary project and that was your first time being on the boat with other people do you want to talk a little bit about how that was and like the difference between being by yourself for extended periods of time versus having a group of ladies and and what women in the wind is and like that whole project well the the solo sailing versus not thing for me personally i mean i started sailing by myself because i didn't know how to sail and so in my mind if i had taken anybody along best friend or not that knew less than me it would have been very scary just because I didn't know anything and now I'm responsible for somebody else. And if I had taken somebody that knew more than me, which most likely would have been a man, then they become the captain. And what am I doing on my boat? I don't know. It was a strange feeling. So I started sailing alone and then I kept sailing alone for two years before I took the boat out of the water. And I really got used to it. I mean, I've always been the kind of person that doesn't like being watched if I'm learning something, you know, I don't know. I'm I'm quite insecure in that way. Yeah, exactly. And so especially then in the beginning, like making mistakes, I really wanted to be alone and make those mistakes by myself. So my process of like sailing and things that I do when I'm alone are very different than what you do around other people. Like, I don't know. I, I, I talk a lot to the boat and it's not that I can't talk to the boat with people around. It just gets a little bit weird. <laughs> there were multiple times and, in the yard where you would just be like, you're so beautiful. And people would turn around and be like, who are you talking to? And you're like, the boat, the boat. I talked to the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and like asking it what it needs and like I don't know there's I might look like a crazy person and you know you don't want your captain to be too crazy when you're going out to sea with them <laughs> and um I mean just like being able to do what like whatever I want whenever I want stay in bed all day or not or uh, yeah anything because with people there, there is a social aspect that happens every day. Like you do wake up and when you see the person, you say good morning. And some mornings, I don't want to say good morning yet. <laughs> I want to wait like three more hours. Hold on. <laughs> and so it's just a totally different rhythm. And for me, it was pretty difficult just because I wasn't used to it at all. And, and it took, took getting used to it. Towards the end, it got a little bit better, like, I, I got into the flow of the, th- of the thing and it was really nice that what I enjoyed the most about sailing with people was mealtime. And um, every mealtime we would gather, whether we talked to each other that day or not, because sometimes, you know, <laughs> and, and at least we would come together like a couple times a day and sit there and enjoy a meal, a meal together, which is always super powerful, I think, in like a community setting. Yeah. A lot to get used to, but well, Women in the Wind, uh, what it is, is uh, the first time I crossed the North Atlantic in 2019, I saw so much plastic. Every single day there was trash floating and it really upset me. And I don't know, just the reality of it shocked me. I knew I had heard about plastic in the ocean and 
whatever before, but really seeing it and seeing it every day, uh, just it changed my perspective of, of the reality of the situation and, and that every single piece of trash that I throw away, no matter where it affects that reality. Um, so I wanted to be able to tell this story in a way, like tell the story of the plastic traveling across uh, the North Atlantic on the Gulf Stream to, to show other people that it's true. It's really out there because we hear about the, the Pacific garbage patch, but we don't live like, I mean, California, yes, but I don't yeah, know. Most but, of I mean, I'm, from States, the, like, I'm not familiar with like this, like East right. Coast home and it's, you just don't hear about it the same way yeah. that you hear about in the Pacific. Exactly. And it's, it's real. Um, so that was the initial goal. Uh, and so we set out on another crossing once I finished the, the refit of the boat. Um, but capturing images of the trash was very difficult. Um, you know, especially when it was storming, it stormed for like a third of the trip. And in those days, it was really, really hard to catch anything uh, on camera. We saw the trash every day. but So the, the, the documentary <clears throat> is more going to focus on the power of the woman and our ability to take on anything, anything. And especially on, on boats like ours, like simple boats that so many men <laughs> tell us are unsafe or they are too afraid <laughs> to, yeah. to sail across the ocean on. And I don't know, just showing that it's not, it's not that scary. And it's just, you believe in yourself and you know your capacity as a human being. And, and also, you know, being a woman out at sea for a month, like 30 days going through your whole cycle and with the moon and three women together and yeah. on the ocean with the rocking. It was, it's uh, yeah. Quite the, quite the documentary it's going to be. Still with this focus of, of the trajectory of the trash, you know, circulating through the Atlantic and everything, but uh, more geared towards just really showing the capacity that we have as women to do anything. Yeah. And what I really want, um, not uh, Women in the Wind is a nonprofit now, um, and all of the profits that we're going to make from this documentary, if, if we sell it, when we sell it, uh, and through other kind of fundraising in the future, uh, Women in the Wind will become a platform to, to sponsor other women who want to take on crazy adventure projects um, with, with an environmental focus. And it doesn't have to be sailing. It can be whatever hiking across what i don't know whatever uh obviously that part's not not running yet because we don't have the funds to be able to support anybody just yet but that's the goal and i'm really really looking forward to that because when we were looking for funds to be able to you know fund this project and and buy equipment and everything it was super hard super 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 hard uh and we weren't able to raise enough so i really want to build this platform to be able to support women so they can focus more on their project and how it's going to happen instead of chasing after money which is such a horrible stupid it's, thing so <laughs> i talk about it all the time like be even beyond literally cutting holes in my hull while it's still in the water and like trying to repair them and having all of the stresses that come with a project like this. I'm like, even more stressful than that is just the fact that you constantly have to worry about funds and money. Yeah. I know I've talked to you about it before, but the amount of low, low paying jobs that I've had and the mental effect that it has on you. And then like to take on something like this and basically have to relearn, I am capable, I am worthy, I am deserving of doing something like this. Like money is always just a very difficult thing I mean at least for me like some people I feel like comes way easier but mm -hmm. it does come we always say that the money comes mm -hmm. but it does. Uh, but, but it takes a long time <laughs> yeah it, it definitely does so you have that whole project that's yeah. your goal with that 
I want to talk a little bit about your latest crossing that you just did from... Uh, I did, I went from... The Cape Verdes from Santiago in, in the Cape Verdes all the way to Ilha Bela in Brazil, direct. So, and how uh, many nautical miles was that in total? I think it was about 3,300, something like that. So, and it took yeah. you how many days? It took me 43 days. Uh which is like 10 days more than what would normally, like if I do 100 miles a day average. So it was quite slow, but I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> so during that crossing, you obviously crossed the equator. How was that? That was, um, well, going through the doldrums was probably the hardest part of the trip most difficult having to deal like you you want to leave your sails up all as many sails as you can because there's no wind and you're trying to catch whatever you can and i don't have an engine to use at sea um but then you have these massive squalls that roll in with like 30 35 knots uh gusts and yeah, you just, you can't, you can't leave all these sails up, especially at night. It was, that was really exhausting. The doldr, like, besides that, besides the, like, extreme difference between no wind and wind, uh, it was the most beautiful, like, time at sea I've ever had. Like, the sunsets and sunrises and having just, like, this calm ocean some days and, uh, it was beautiful. And then crossing the equator, um, crossing the equator, I think the trades had already kicked in by that time. They were starting from the southeast. So I did have some wind and I was already sailing. And it was funny because right at the equator, it was like a party. There were so many birds and fish and just so much life in the ocean all around me like thousands of birds right at the equator it was so cool it was so cool it just felt like a, like a rite of passage and like a I don't know a welcoming from the ocean for a lot of sailors that is a big thing to cross the equator I mean that's yeah like a I mean, I'm basically like, it's not imaginary, but it's like the, our dividing point on earth between the two hemispheres. So it's yeah. really, really cool. And then to have to, a welcome like that is, I'm sure, just magical. So cool. It was so cool. And then to just realize like later that day, I was like, I'm in the South Atlantic now. What? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? It was so weird because I've never, I never thought I would be in the South Atlantic with my boat. Even, even like after I already started making plans to go to Brazil two years ago, I was like, yeah, whatever. My light plans. Sure. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> but it happened. And I don't know. I just, I love it so much. The freedom that, that sailing uh, and sailing so simply gives me because still to this day, if I had a, uh, a lagoon or Fontaine Peugeot or something, I wouldn't be able to be. I would not, I would have to be producing content and doing all this stuff to survive, which right now I don't have to do and I can choose not to do just because the boat is so simple and because like it's it's not the same amount of expense as I, I any other normal boat really. Imagine, and I know we talked about right. it a lot, like when you were in the yard, because you were right next to a leopard. It was right? a leopard, yeah, leopard forty four, yeah. And you guys kind of had like a little competition going on, which was like mm -hmm. gonna get back in faster. And I think you won that, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, okay. just the expense that goes into something that's so production and so yeah. specific compared to this where it's like oh well this is what I need to do like let me just go look at a pile of wood and see how I can mm -hmm. make it work 
Um, Mm -hmm. It's completely different. I want to circle back a little to the simplicity because one of the questions that I had a lot of people ask uh, on Instagram when I said that we were going to do this little chat is that your boat is very simple. So what do you do for safety? We know that you've had uh, a track record of things breaking on passage. So yeah like preparing for that and then yeah just like safety I know somebody asked if you had a life raft or like anything I I have a life raft now just because of the the trip with the girls I mean that was another thing like touching back on the subject of difference you know what really was difficult for me sailing with other people was uh being responsible for their lives that shit's scary oh my god and uh so i did have a a life raft i still have it it's very heavy and i really want to get rid of it (laughs) 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 which i might um so there's a beauty about a wooden boat especially a wooden catamaran that it doesn't really sink uh you can fill it with water and it's still gonna float which is cool And if one side fills with water, the other side's still floating. And warums have watertight bulkheads. So uh, fore and aft is is sealed from the center of the boat. Mm -hmm. Um, All the bilges are separate. Even though if they do fill up quickly, they would overflow into each other. Um, If it's a small leak or something, they're, they're totally separate from each other. There's 24 bilge compartments in the boat. I don't have any bilge pumps, so I have to pump them manually. But just those things in the design of the boat make it so safe. And warms are famous for not capsizing, um, which is a danger in multi-hulls. But the design, the, sh- the sharp V, the, the width between the hulls, and uh, that they're wow. not so low. Yeah. They have a lot of, of spa- uh, freeboard, right? Yeah. Between the water and the deck. Um, low aspect ratio for the mast for the rigging, especially now with the, the rig that I have. All of these things are, they make the boat so safe. And then the, the cabin tops are on the sides. I'm only really in the center of the boat. I do go to the aft to like fix the steering and stuff, but I'm never walking on the side, which most boats, catamarans, monohulls, you have to go around the cabin. A little narrow. I hate that. I think that's super dangerous. Yeah. I think that's very, very dangerous. Um, so there are just so many, so many things that make uh, a warm really safe and, and mine as well. And then what was the other part of the safety question? Uh, things breaking. Yeah, things breaking. <laughs> things break. Um, and I've learned that you should just take two of everything. <laughs> and this time, well, in the Azores, I changed my boom because when we left Florida, we had a really heavy maple tree that we cut down to use as a boom. And it was very heavy. I loved it because it looked so cool, but it just wasn't efficient. So in the Azores, I got um, a new boom out of Japanese cedar, which is very, very light. And there was another trunk uh, tree, rather, laying there already kind of cured and nobody was using it. So I took it as an extra. And that I tied under the boat between the hulls and along the beams. I tied them along on the beams. And it was just in case. And mostly it's in my mind, it's like in case I lose my mast. I need to be prepared to jury rig. Because I've lost my mast before, and and then I continued to sail another two thousand miles across the Atlantic on a jury rig. So it's possible, and there's no way in hell that I'm abandoning my boat if it's floating and everything's fine. There's no way. That's my home. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm absolutely prepared to like float across the ocean for four months if I have to, but. So I don't have to. I take extra, extra trees. <laughs> and this, on this trip now in the doldrums, so still at the beginning of the trip, um, I had a really heavy squall that, that popped my 
boom. And it really, it broke because it was freshly cut. Like I, it got cut in the same day it was shaped and already put on the boat. So it wasn't cured. It wasn't strong. Uh, and it probably blew like 40 knots out of nowhere and, and broke the boom. Um, but luckily I had an extra under the boat waiting for me. It took a couple of days to be able to get in the water, put the dinghy in the water and get the boat. I mean, the boom untied and back on deck because it was rough, but I mean, if I hadn't had that, it would have taken me much longer to arrive. I might have not even been able to continue the trip. I might have actually changed my course and gone to the Caribbean just because downwind would have been easier. And I was super far away from my destination. So, but uh, extras, 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 all the rope in the world. <laughs> Take as much good rope as you can, especially if you can find like Dyneema straps or whatever. Take that shit and sticks. <laughs> you know, the amount of times people have been like, are you going to get rid of that rope? I'm like, no. It's no. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I remember in the yard, I took out all my ropes to dry one day and, and the owner of the leopard was there and he's like, what do you have all that rope for? It's like to survive at sea. What yeah. do you mean? <laughs> One piece of advice for somebody that's just starting their journey. Oh, one, only one. <laughs> <laughs> Believe in yourself. Don't listen to other people. I mean, obviously there, there are great people to listen to and there's wonderful advice and conversations to be had and, and it does produce growth. But if, if you have that feeling that we were talking about, that you are on the right path, trust that more than what other people think, especially for something as crazy as like buying a boat or restoring a boat, or especially a fucking wooden catamaran. So, <laughs> I mean, really being selective at, at listening to people's more negative uh, views on what you might be doing because most of the time it's just their own projection and their own fear just trust yourself and keep going every day just a little bit little bit little bit like I cannot believe that I'm out of the boatyard that I already sailed twice across the Atlantic I cannot believe it <laughs> I thought it was never going to end up until the last day I was still painting my bootstripe white the like when they came we're coming with the lift to pick me up, to put me in the water. So up until that moment, it wasn't real. Like I, I pinned my rudders on after they picked me up and they were waiting for me to like finish up and paint the, the bottom where the, the, the stands were. So there was no end. I never reached a point where I was like, oh, I'm done now. And then I got back into the water and still had work to do. So yeah, man, just keep going. Just keep going. Keep going. If it feels good, keep going. And eventually, God, you're not even going to be able to believe that what you went through is so far in the past already, you know? Yeah. No, I, I mean, mean you're like, in the middle of it right now. Yeah, like, I have, like, a journal, which I wrote down interview questions in, but like, I have, like, pages of just literally bullets, because you're like, that's what you did. I'm taking that, because I my mind has just been all over the place. And it's like, I finally was able to paint my galley. I bought paint for the interior of my boat the first day I got here, which was in July. And it's now mid January. And like, I just, it's unbelievable to look back and see, oh, I had my entire deck pulled up and mm -hmm. was bolting on supports for my center deck while I was like bobbing up and down in a dinghy with like a <laughs> stupid <laughs> wind. That's what I had to do because like none of the yards here would haul me. And yeah, it, it does like it goes by so quickly. But at the same time, when you're in it, like there are so many days I'm like, I'm never going to leave. So, but hopefully it's soon, hopefully soon. No, I mean, it happens eventually. Everything ends. That's one of the most important lessons I think I've learned from the ocean itself is that nothing lasts forever. Happiness, sadness, storms, good weather, 
uh, sunshine, rain, nothing lasts forever. And you being stuck in the boatyard, as long as you're working, is not going to last forever. And that's it. And you will get to the end. And, and it's just so unbelievable. But yeah, no, when you're in it, it's very overwhelming. I had, I would call, I mean, I talked to you when you were there, everybody. I'm like, this is I'm stuck forever. This is never going to end. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, ah, yeah. But I don't know. There's this, yeah, something beneath it that tells you that it's right. And taking on a project like this. At the same time, having people be like, it's not worth it. It was one time where I had somebody that was like, oh, just like work at Costco, save up and get a real job. Or not a real job, sorry, a real boat. They wanted me to get a real job so I could get a real boat. And it's like, it is a real boat. Like, I boat sailed thousands of miles halfway across the world. Just needs a little bit of love. Having to endure that at the same time that you're dealing yeah. with. Yeah, no, it's tough. I mean, having people come up to you and be like, why don't you fucking burn this thing? What is this? Like, are you stupid? Like, I just, it's so, it was so shocking to me when that would happen to me in the yard because like I'm talking to somebody who owns a generic white fucking mass produced catamaran and they only sail to the Bahamas and back to Florida and to the Bahamas and back to Florida. And like, yeah. I know the potential of my book. Yeah. And so like, what, why would you say, why, first of all, even if you sailed more, whatever, it doesn't matter. Why would you ever waste your breath saying something like that to somebody who's trying their best? you know yeah. it makes no sense to me I feel like there's so many people they're like well I'm coming from a place of concern like I'm trying to help and <laughs> what we do would be considered risky but it's very calculated yeah absolutely um but I mean I think going out to sea on any boat is risky risk. exactly yeah well, and-, and and honestly, I think our boats, for all the reasons that I stated earlier, wooden, catamarans, bulkhead, blah, 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 blah. In my mind, it makes me feel safer than if I were to like say, okay, I'm going to cross the ocean twice in one year on a monohull. Because if I hit something on a monohull, it can sink in less than three minutes and be gone. You know, and people don't think about that or, or, or they ignore that, that argument when they're looking at, because the appearance of our boat seems, our boats seem so unsafe, Mm -hmm. but this structure, the construction of the boat uh, is not, it's very, very well constructed, super strong, very safe. Um, I don't know. It's, it's a tough one. And I think, I guess, you know, just us sailing and doing it uh, speaks louder than any argument ever will. Well, yeah, exactly. And I'm excited to like get to that point. And I know the biggest advice you gave me is you're like, just sail it, just go, just sail it. (laughs) I was, I've not been able to do that yet, which sucks. Well, no. And I mean, even sailing in San Francisco, I mean, that's, it's rough, rough, rough. So yeah, it's way different than me being able to start in the Caribbean, you know? Yeah. It's, um, that being said, I feel like when people have conversations with me about sailing, they always make it seem like a thousand times more intimidating than it actually is. Cause like I've done sailing offshore I've done overnights like I it's not like I'm entering into this just like I think boats are pretty just with complete carelessness when I first got here obviously I'm very familiar with the east coast as far as just weather patterns and the landscape and just overall I guess like essence of sailing community you know what I mean? Like the general like feel and vibe of the sailing community coming out to the Bay Area, which is a place that has a huge nautical history. 
to find that it's been pretty unfriendly to like people like Mm -hmm. trying to do something that I want to do. Like we have so many limits on how long you can anchor um, and where you can anchor. And when you're at a marina, like how long you can stay, what can be done. I've had boat yards turn me away for like every single reason you could possibly imagine. And it's like Mm -hmm. only really friendly for like, recreational sailing on the weekends like it's not friendly for people who are living aboard or wanting to cruise or do anything like that and I've had people come up so many times being like oh you're just from the east coast you don't know how this like west coast sailing is and like for so long I was so intimidated and then I had the opportunity go out the golden gate and don't get me wrong like I know that especially in the bay currents can be really crazy it can get really rough here but like as soon as I was offshore I was like this is the same like it's the same yeah Yeah. it's Uh and it, it was such a relief to like be able to experience that instead of just having all these old men come up to me and be like like if you've sailed in the bay, you've sailed anywhere. The Pacific is unlike any other. Like you know, <laughs> there's so many like okay, yeah, yeah. So try the North Atlantic. <laughs> I well that and then it's like there's um, which again I know can be super gnarly, but it's Point Conception, which is you I, you lived in California for a while. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, yeah. So point conception, like basically like the dividing spot between like Northern California and Southern California. Some people refer to it as California's Cape Horn and mm-hmm. can get very intense. And I've like talked to some people that are like, I, it's so intimidating. And then other people are like, oh, it's like glass. And then the realistic people that you talk to are just like, yeah. just do weather routing, like pull off yeah. weather before. It's the same with anywhere. Like, just exactly. be aware and look into it. Like, yeah. just so much, like, hyping up of, oh, it's mm-hmm. so different. And it's not, so. Yeah. I found, um, in my experience talking with, especially old men, <laughs> but, no, I, I don't know, a lot of boaters. The people who will tell you storm stories and love their storm stories have never really been in a storm. They've been in like a little bit of rough weather and it really marked them. But once you're, yeah, no, if you've really been in a storm and you really understand what that's like, it, it doesn't, it's not this dramatic story that you want to tell people anymore. It really is not. And these scare tactics, these, these stories to like intimidate people and scare people, I think they, they come from a place, uh, people, those people being afraid, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and they don't want you to be braver than them. Well, it just, ne- it, like, they never come from a place of, th- these are the mistakes that I made, and this is how I would change them yes. when I do it again. It's just like, oh, it's rough. Yes. And that's not helpful at yeah. all. Right. It, it's not the ocean's fault. The ocean is, it's not personal at all. It's your own reaction and, and you know, all of that. So, yeah, when the blame is, is placed on the, the weather and the environment and, oh, it's rough, like, well, what could you have done better, right? Like weather routing or, or whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah, for sure. I agree with that 100%. So, and that goes back to the other thing of like the advice, you know, don't listen to too many people because it's, everybody has an opinion, you know, don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Really, really, really don't because all I have is an opinion based on my experience and my experience is going to be different than anybody else's. But one thing uh, I wanted to mention before I forget is like, really even when it's hard really enjoy where you are and what you're doing right now because once it's over like those memories that struggle of being in this boatyard it being so expensive it raining storming like you trying to 
learn how to uh, work with a, uh, an old boat and learn things that you've never done before. That, oh man, if I could go back to the boatyard now and do it again, I would. I would. Because it just like, the, the amount of growth and learning and everything that comes from that experience, even though it's hard to see in the moment and it is frustrating in the moment, afterwards it's invaluable. So whenever you can, just remind yourself that like where you are right now, you'll never forget it, you know? And so just absorb as much of it as you can because you're really going to want it in the future to be able to like close your eyes and be like, wow, like I can't believe I suffered that much. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are days where I'm like emotions and all that, like it comes in waves. There are days where I'm like, I'm, yeah. I'm so proud of myself. And then there are days where I'm like, just get me south. Like it's yeah. freaking raining. Absolutely. Rain. Which this Absolutely. is not over California, Dude. but the rain. Yeah, no, but it's crazy there right now. Yeah. And the rain and working on a boat, on a wooden boat, makes everything impossible. Mm -hmm. So, But you'll make it. I'm so stoked. I'm so proud of you. I'm so excited for Maranaka to have a little twin so we can travel together. <laughs> I know. I keep having, I told you the other day, but I keep having dreams of you being like, no, you have to like bring your boat across the continent. <laughs> on <laughs> land. So we can buy your boat. Yeah, like I'm like, literally trailering pulling it behind me across Brazil <laughs> yeah. well I mean if you feel inclined <laughs> no I, I think I'll pass on that one because usually I'm also going to chase by balls <laughs> <laughs> oh man I did have another question um and we talked about it a little bit self-steering um because obviously mm -hmm. you're not at the helm the whole time uh and what you do is not necessarily I mean, it is very traditional, but mm -hmm. when you tell people about it now, it's probably a little out there. Um, yeah. You do sheet to tiller. Right. And it, I mean, wow. My life has changed when I learned how to do that. The boat, Maranoka does steer itself all the way to a broad reach without sheet to tiller, but it's just not as... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, precise. Mm -hmm. um, so with sheet to tiller, for example, this trip, 43 days, from the moment I lifted the anchor until the moment I grabbed the mooring ball in Brazil, I was at the helm for 25 minutes in 43 days from beginning to end, which is so cool. Like if I had to steer for 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever these horror stories that I hear, I would not be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> and the best part about it is like, if something breaks, it's way easier to fix that than like have a whole electronic autopilot system. Absolutely. And I mean, so this on this trip, because I was, I had the sail, everything on the same side, basically the whole trip on the same tack, um, the, the line, which is the same line that I've been using for the last four and a half years, uh, it started chafing. And so before it, it chafed all the way through, I just cut it and did a little sheet bend. It became a little bit shorter, but still the same thing. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy because it's so efficient and there's really nothing that can break. I mean, the, you have to take care of your tillers, your rudders, which should be fine. And yeah. then the pulleys, which sometimes they come untied or they pop or whatever, and just tie them back onto the stays or the shrouds. And the rope, super simple. And, and the, the precision of it. Like I, I watch my track on Navionics sometimes, and <clears throat> it, I find it to be more precise than an autopilot. Not a wind vane, but like a... An, whatever the other ones are, like, like the hydraulic. Electric. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you planning on uh, going from here? I know you're in Brazil. Are you planning on staying there for a while? And then where can people find you to follow your adventures? Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm in Brazil and I grew up here. So I'm just super happy to be home. And I, my plan was 
to leave already in a few months and use the, the winter storms down here in the middle of the year to push me north back to the Caribbean and then do another Atlantic crossing because I love it. But um, I think I've changed my mind. I think I'll stick around Brazil for probably until winter Southern Hemisphere 2024. And yeah, just enjoy. The, it's so beautiful here. And like between where I am in Ilha Bela to Rio de Janeiro, uh, all the area in between is green mountains, islands, jungle, and sea. It's amazing. <laughs> so I'm really excited. And then, yeah, uh, I have Instagram, Where's Kiana? And I have Where's Kiana.com. I'm going to be posting my journal. Um, for the this past Atlantic crossing to Brazil, um, like a log and journal and everything on the blog in the next couple of weeks, once I'm done posting everything on Patreon first. And then a very exciting thing to look out for is we are going to release the trailer for the documentary February 1st, uh, which is so exciting. <laughs> And that'll be on Women in the Wind. And if people want to sign up for Patreon, uh, for the Women in the Wind Patreon, it will be released there sooner, maybe even next week. Um, but then it should be out soon, very soon. Thank you so much for coming on and chatting. It's I love it. I love it. I'm so stoked for this project. I think it's absolutely amazing. And I definitely hope to get invited back on. <laughs> You'll be like, I I'll love be like, you. I'll be like, hey, this is like my tenth time. I haven't had somebody lined up. So if you just want to like, chat, absolutely, anytime. So and it's it's so smooth too because like we're actually friends and we know each other. So it just yeah. is is nice and yeah. easy. But thank you. I'll, I'll be your fill in anytime. Great. Well, good. Thank you so much, and I'm sure I. Well, stay tuned with everything that you're doing, but hopefully everyone else will as nice. well with all of your travels as well as your Women in the Wind project. So, thanks so much. You're Love you. Love you too. <laughs>